connectivity project, uh, which is part of the XA scale computing project of the US Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne Oak Region Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, and will be the host for today's webinar, Software Packaging. Uh, the webinar will be presented by David Rogers. David is a computational scientist in the National Center for Computational Science uh, Division at the uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, where he works on mathematical and computational the theory jointly for uh, multi-scale modeling using high-performance computing. He obtained his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Cincinnati, followed by a postdoc at Sandia National Labs and a faculty position in the Department of Chemistry at the University of South Florida. He joined Oak Ridge in 2020. He has published on a range of topics, including statistical mechanical methods in liquids, biomolecules, and quantum models, small known equilibrium systems, hydration, and finite size effects in nanoscale devices. We have issued um, around 200 tickets for today's webinar, and uh, all attendees have been muted upon entry. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. Uh, we'll be pasting the URL to that the doc in the chat momentarily. We have asked David to address to add breaks during his presentation so he can respond to the questions that come in. David, I'll stop my sharing and you take over, please. All right, my slide should be showing. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, David Rogers, a computational scientist, um, as Austin introduced. Um, I guess I should also say David M. Rogers, not David H. Rogers. There's another David Rogers, um, who is the author of the, the Cinema Package for Visualization. Um, I'm, I'm David M. Rogers. Um, so my specialty and, and background is computational chemistry. Having done that, I appreciate a whole lot um, packages that I work with that are structured as libraries. And every time I'm building scientific software, I'm always trying to think about um, how can I make this software easier to install and to use? And um, how do I depend on other packages reliably that are that are uh, that are the packages that I'm going to need to import in order to get my work done for today? So this presentation is is kind of my collection of ideas about that. Um, this slide just shows the uh, preferred license um, and acknowledgement for this um, for this presentation I'm giving today. Um, I want to put my acknowledgments up front to thank all the developers that I work with, uh, a lot of these on a, a daily basis, especially the ideas team who helped give me some feedback um, on early versions of this presentation. Um, I also work with uh, several development teams that are, are listed here, and uh, some of them are kind of featured as examples. Um, See, and and I'm on the, um, the Coral Two packaging work group as as kind of like a, a super minor role in in just trying out some of the and you know, listening to some of the, the packaging progress that's happening there. So there's a lot of uh, fantastic stuff that's happening in packaging and and supercomputing. For the talk today, I am going to go over um, maybe just some general guidelines that are why package and and what are we trying to accomplish? It, you know, what's the definition of done for a software package um, and release process? Then I'll go through walkthroughs that are that are the the technologies and kind of the conventions that have worked really well to put together software packages with minimal effort um, that are usable, um, also with minimal effort. I'll talk a little bit about containers uh, just briefly because it's it's involved in this whole packaging space. And then uh, because I really like to go to real world examples to illustrate what I'm talking about, I've picked out a couple of, of good ones um, from the wild that are that are trying to accomplish performance portability and and packageable package their software in a reproducible rebuildable way so first off the the maybe the before we even get started with packaging why package um we're all familiar with that undocumented feature or the the undocumented code that looks really great on the surface or from the from the literature uh, where they say that they've done all these great things with their software and yet when you pick it up um, there, there's really a, a lot of question marks as to how you're supposed to install and, and get working and use this thing. 
Um, so here is kind of a, a simple cartoon of a person who just pushes the button, but then ends up running away screaming because they weren't really sure what was supposed to happen after they pushed the button. Um, as you're packaging, the key questions uh, that you actually want to make sure that you answer um, are, what does this package do? How do I set it up as a user? And, um, and also explain really well any kind of automation that you've put into your package, because automation can be great, but it requires great documentation. Another concept that I want to emphasize as I go through this uh, talk is that as you're packaging, you should think about the packaging process, both from the producer of software, so the developer mindset where, where you want to be able to click the build and test button and, and get to a get to a state where you know your software is is releasable but from a you also want to think about packaging your software from a um from a downstream perspective and a downstream are the the, the consumers of your package the people who will be importing your package as they build their own software and so um those those downstreams um, you can say they're, they're de downstream developers or users of your package they also have a perspective which is important to, to think about as you're going through the packaging process all right also on uh kind of to finish up the idea on why package standards and conventions can save everyone time um, they make life easier because um, if you package in a standard way it really removes a lot of guesswork from your user's perspective all right, so let's jump into uh, general guidelines and themes. Um, if you start from a portable build system that has uh, that has a, a great you know make or or see make or or configure install process, um, that portable build system is what you can base your packaging strategy off of. So I'm, I'm not just going to talk about the portable build system, although it's a big part of it, um, but I'm I'm going to say that. Creating a portable build system is kind of like your, your base to start exploring on different systems and, and using your code in different ways with different downstreams, et cetera. As a general idea, it's great to always keep your source and documentation together so that every time you make a change in your source code, you can make a change in your documentation. Um, LAMPS, uh, as the, the molecular dynamics package uh, from Sandia, does a really great job of keeping the source and the documentation synced. And, and you can see, you know, when when people update the source, they, they usually go and they also update the documentation. Uh, PySCF, which is another example, I'll, I'll show some of the um, build process from here because they, they do great on their build process. They created a separate repository to hold their documentation. Um, so some you know your mileage may vary sometimes your your own circumstances say we have to to separate source and documentation um, i would generally recommend keeping them together in the same vein you want to keep your source and tests together so uh, where your software package sits and you have your source and your headers you should also have tests there um, so that as you change your source you can also change the tests and it, it keeps everything um, tested in it easier to keep in a tested and working state some repositories and projects maintain separate reference artifact repositories, though, as kind of a note. And I think that's also a good practice because um, in HPC, a lot of the ways that we test our software is to you know, run the software and compare the output to a reference artifact. Uh, keeping those reference artifacts in a separate repository just, just keeps all the data separate and your test process can download the reference artifact and check it. That's okay. Um, so keep the source for your tests with your source, uh, but keep maybe the reference artifacts separate is okay. Um, as you start to build your software um, and, and get larger and larger, get a larger code base um, with more functionality, you always want to be thinking about making modular codes. And so as you, um, as you build more functionality, you should always be asking the question, can I take a piece of my source code and, and write it as its own separate package? Um, and this is especially true for optional components or abstraction layers um, or glue code. One ex good example is BLAST++ um, and the, the BLAST++ library, or is it called the, the BLASTPP library, is, um, is a, a wrapper for a whole bunch of different ways to talk to BLAST, but it, it gives you C++ templated uh, matrix multiplies so that you can talk to it from a C++ code, um, but underneath it's calling basic BLAST. Uh, so those kinds of... Um, the abstractions can be really helpful to package up and make us their own separate um, software package. So um, finally, on, on guidelines and themes, I want to talk about uh, some do's and don'ts. 
thinking both as a developer and as a user, um, it's good as a developer to have your uh, continuous integration or CI is continuous integration where you're you're building your source code and you're testing it as you're as you're putting it um, up to the public GitHub repository. Um, it's good to have a CI level integration test that simulates an external user downloading and and installing your package and its dependencies for the first time. Um, so that that high level test is great because it it shows the user perspective every time. Um, as a developer, we can forget that because we have a lot of the dependencies sitting on our system already and we don't think about them. Um, but users may see a new version of the of the dependency and and you won't know about it until you get a bug report saying, oh, we now have to go back and rethink our software stack. Uh, so that's a, this is a way to avoid that. Um, you do want to document a manual install process that that would be what steps you would actually run if you did this manually. Um, so not just like the artifact that's in the CI that explains, you know, to a, a computer how to install it, but also document uh, the process for installing. Um, a lot of projects go one step further and actually give you some helpful hints on installing dependencies. Um, some examples that I can call out are pick and GPUs documentation tells you how to install Boost, which is great because Boost can be complicated to install. But if you go and look at their documentation, they tell you how to install it. And now pick and GPU becomes a lot easier to install and use. Similarly for DFT FE, they have a giant dependency on DL2, which is a, um, a finite element package. And DL2 is complex to install, but DFT FE documents how to install it specifically for use um, in this package. You can actually look through the GitHub workflows folders uh, as a last resort for packages that don't do this, uh, but I recommend talking about your install process. Um, don't assume that, that everyone has access to apt-get or some sort of virtual machine for getting all the dependencies and running them. Uh, talk about how you would install them through the shell so that your users can, um, so that users on, on systems that just have shell access as a user can, can think through how they can get all their dependencies up and running. As a consumer, on the other side, uh, there's advantages to the developer because as a consumer, uh, once all the documentation is sitting there and and your your package is tested and it's supposed to be working uh, in an automated, semi-automated install fashion, uh, you have the ability as a as a downstream as a as a package consumer to go and talk to the development team about the install process. You can you can complain politely if something doesn't run as documented, um, and you can actually contribute back uh, vital fixes just in the form of of how do I compile this package. It's also good if you notice that there's an issue with documentations for your upstreams um, to go and and submit issues and and talk to those developers because that way the developers know you you're there and you're using their package but also they get contributions so that the package is easier to use. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna move forward to simple walkthroughs unless there are questions at this point. I can't see the questions if there are questions. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, some simple walkthroughs that just show the, the some pretty well-tested um, conventions for packaging um, are, I'm going to give you a pie scaffold example, some CMake examples, and a little bit of a SPAC example. Um, so that you can see that just high level pictures of some conventions. You've probably seen these as well. So I'll, I'll talk through, um, they just kind of point you to the, the main ideas. Um, before you start to package, there's a couple of things you should think about and, and think about with your developer team, um, which would be is this package something I'm going to reuse? Can I see myself as a user of this package downloading, installing, and depending on it? Um, is the documentation good enough that another developer can quickly get it working? Um, because if, if your documentation isn't good, you're gonna have to start here. Um, and so you have to be ready to, to work on the documentation and, and get that going as your, as your packaging proceeds. It's also, um, if, you, if you're part of a large developer team or part of a big project, uh, you have to think for a minute on whether or not you can hold development of new features while you package up what's here. Um, if, you're, if your project is, is large, um, it, it can be non-trivial to actually hit the pause button and say, this is the set of features we want to create as release number 1.0. It's also important to ask if you've tested this in practice. So do you have enough tests that will start from a clean copy, follow the directions and run a few tests and show that everything is, is green and ready to go? Um, as you 
package and release it, you will also be able to interact with users. So what kind of support do you want to offer or, or do you want to put in a disclaimer as to how you're going to interact with users? Um, you should also consider whether you've put in a license, uh, what license is required. Um, at some, uh, at, at the DOE sites, there are probably, a, there's a, a process that you should go through that you should be able to talk to your site contacts on, on uh, getting a copyright. Uh, assertion and and what um, kind of review process your source code needs to go through before you can publish it. And also, um, finally, as you package and release these things, you're going to have to use Git branches to somehow show what state your project was in when you released it. So you should have an understanding or and a documented understanding of of what branch names you're going to use for your releases and what your tags are going to represent. And of course, capturing those in documentation is great so that people who, who look at those numbers and names can know what they mean, um, but also for other developers on your project. So here's uh, a simple example that I'll be using just to show the basic David, packaging. Go ahead. Hey, David, I have a question for you here. I think it's a good point. So what do you mean by packaging in, the, in this context here? Does it mean everything you need uh, is packaged together to the point of almost plug, in, pl plug and play? There's different kinds, of, yeah, so the definition of done, right? So I would say your package is is done and released if you say if you have a if you have a document that describes how someone will use your software. Um, your document could be as simple as copy this Python file to your site packages to your site packages folder and import it. Or your documentation could be a little bit more complex and say what dependencies it's going to use and give you examples of different ways to use your software. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, a package is a, a documented process for using your software. Okay, uh, go ahead, please. In the example that I'm developing, I'm gonna show you know, the, the common, the, the big three uh, types of software that people release. They're Python, C, and Fortran um, executables and libraries. And for those, there's, um, there's a, some tools that I can talk through that will that will get your package to a state where the documentation doesn't have to be 15 pages long on an explanation of how to how to use this thing. Uh, if you use the uh, the Python packaging process I'll talk about or the or the CMake package uh, process, then your documentation can be as simple as you know CMake uh, CMake install and then for importing I'll I'll show you what the import line looks like. Um, so the example is super minimal because that lets us you know, start from something that we can build on. First question to ask is how will other projects use this work, right? I've got, um, I've got a heat equation solver that's going to you know, do the, the time integration of, of heat along a one dimensional line. Um, other programs will see, other downstream users will see this as executables that, that work with the artifacts that the, that the code um, generates right. So if I have got a if I've got a an array of of heat as a function of one dimension, then I'm going to have to have some tools that I release to to deal with those. Um, I might also have different you know serial and parallel run programs. Um, those would all go into prefix bin. Um, headers usually go into prefix include project. So if other programs are going to use this as a library, they'll have to include the headers. And then they'll have to source the libraries as they compile. Um, so these would be the install locations for headers and libraries. Um, and mostly I'm going to talk about headers and libraries because executables are relatively simpler. OK, so the front lines of this, of course, are documentation. I should explain what each one of these things does to my users so that they know, OK, if I want to use this program, I include heat.h and I link with libheat.so. And now I can use all this cool functionality. The functionality is explained. Um, as a general, um, as I go through each one of these um, different programming language uh, conventions, I'm going to use this kind of um, this kind of workflow. First, document what the end users are expected to do. Uh, then, kind of structure what targets I'm, and by target I mean the libraries and the executables. Um, what targets I'm going to to install into the system. Then test the install run process. If it's working, of course, then we can do the, the tag release and create uh, downstream dependencies and work with users, et cetera. If it's not working, then we go back to the documentation stage. 
from a user's perspective, um, and this should be like a, a nice review slide, importing a Python package can work in a, a basic way or an advanced way. And the basic way is just to um, basically, as I'm building my own multi-physics program, I say I require heat equation at, at a certain version greater than 0.1. Um, then I can use pip to install this requirement for my heat EQ. Um, then my own program, I set this to the pi the the Python path, which which contains the, the place where these files were copied, and my app imports HeatEQ. In an advanced usage, I can actually use a package manager to install HeatEQ, and in that case, the user would actually um, be able to create a virtual environment in Python, activate the virtual environment, and install um, my package into their virtual environment with pip. Um, so I'll show you uh, kind of the advanced case. This one is more of a copy-paste case. This one is um, using a, a tool to help you install your package. setup.config is the um, is the file I'll talk about in a second. And also let's see you can you can import from HDQ different parts of HDQ uh, that are inside of, of HDQ's um, list of libraries that it creates. So in the Python library structure that I've talked about, let's say my um, Python heat.py file includes a params class, an energy class, and a simulate function. Um, those will eventually get copied to a heatEQ subdirectory. Um, in order to use this thing as a Python package and in modern Python conventions, I have to have an init.py sitting inside of heatEQ, even if it's empty, um, so that when I'm importing thing names from inside of heatEQ, um, I can ask for heatEQ.pheat, so I'm getting stuff from the, the Python heat file. Um, from inside of my own package, I would use .pheat import params to import the params class. Uh, so say that there's a file next to pheat, it would use this kind of import statement. Um, from a user's or downstream perspective, if I'm installing, if I'm importing something from this file, I would use from heatEQ, like the name of the package, uh, dot the name of the file, import simulate. and it, you can customize this from here, but this is kind of the basic idea. PyScaffold will give you a nice way to um, a, a canonical install method for your Python package. Um, what PyScaffold does is uh, you can pip install it and also pip install the tox tool so that you can use a lot of the functionality of PyScaffold. What it does is it creates the basic scaffolding, the, the files like setup.py and setup.config that Python understands and knows how to work with so that you don't have to remember, you don't have to memorize the exact format of all of the, the Python setup files. You take this basic scaffold and you customize it for your own, your own use cases. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of that. I'm, I'm just going to give you kind of the before and after picture because I'm sure that you guys can custom, customize this yourself. Um, I want to mention that it has great uh, presets for writing tests, um, doing documentation with Sphinx as part of the build process, and even publishing your package to the PyPy package index. Um, so I actually was able to publish a Python package called MPI list this way. All right, so after applying PyScaffold, basically what it's done is it's, it's pasted a lot of boilerplate in here that you can now go and customize. Setup.config is one that you definitely want to customize because you can tell it a list of projects um, that your project will depend on. So if I wanted to use some sort of advanced numerical solver um, that can be imported through Python, then I would list it in setup.config. Also notice that it imposes kind of its own directory structure. It wants you to put the name of your package inside the source directory. Um, and now inside your README, you should also be careful um, to follow through with example with what I'm telling you to, to do here is uh, explain to your downstream users how to install your package. So you should put a note as uh, this package can be installed with pip in, pip e install. Uh, the dash e is you can check the manual on this button, but it makes it editable. So as a developer, you can edit and iterate. All right. So having talked about the Python um, example, and, and if you go online and look through the, the slides of this, you'll get the links and be able to get more details on each one of these examples. Um, I'm going to move on to the C++ package example. In a C++ package, there's a basic install. Uh, it's kind of a, a basic use method that a user would see and an advanced use, met, use method. The basic use, use method, um, users will just manually be 
telling the compiler where to look for the installs in the libraries. Um, our path is great to use so that your, your executable knows where the library is um, after the link time. So at runtime, it can actually go and check this path to find the library that it was built with. Um, inside the C file, of course, your, your number including the, um, the header file, and you can just use the names that are now in the library. In the CMake method of doing things, you don't write the, the arguments to the compiler directly. Instead, you create a target, which is the, um, the application target. See, I don't actually have the line in here that creates the target, but um, we create the app target and we tell it that we need the app.cpp file as, as the source for building the app target. To link it to the library is the key part. And in, in the CMake way of doing things, key to queue is a package which uh, CMake can find the package definition for. And once CMake has found its package definition, then you can say that my app program is going to link on the, uh, the heat target provided by the heatEQ package. And now I'm able to do things like uh, use the CMake generation facilities to generate an input um, config header that turns CMake define into a number define enable heat equation as one. The way that the programs, the, the way that the source files themselves get, get built is pretty standard. Um, G++ with shared will create the, the heat.so shared library and the headers basically get copied into um, include. It's good to put your package name here so that you don't pollute the, the uh, main level include directory. And then I would include heat.hpp or include heatEQ slash heat.hpp depending, um, depending on how you wanna document and use your program. Something to watch out for um, as you as you start to build complicated software um, libraries is that if I'm building a multi-physics code that's depending on multiple things um, and also depends on this heat equation, but heat equation is depending on other downstream, uh, other upstream libraries, um, so upstream to downstream, then then I start to have transitive build link requirements, things like compiler features that are needed to understand headers. Um, or linking features, all of these kind of trickle down so that the multi-physics code has to be aware of a lot of a lot of nuances and, and compiler flags that that it needs to run with in order to get all of this stuff working at once. The um, there are ways to solve this problem. Package config is one of them. That's the kind of the automake method. Um, CMake is another one where, uh, as I just explained, CMake can install a project config.cmake which defines a target. Here's what goes into those targets. Um, I think it's a little bit verbose, but it, it is, it's workable and there are examples out there that you can, that you can start customizing. I'm linking you to a couple of examples here for um, just kind of a, a very basic, here's how you create a, a CMake target that releases a library. What a CMake target is, is a, um, it, it's a list of source files that create a library or source files that create an executable. Um, but also you can give that executable or library attributes, attributes like I need to, the C++ 14 standard. And those attributes, CMake knows how to turn into um, compile flags. So as you build your program, you create a bunch of targets. You can install all of these targets um, as, a, as a, um, a package file that CMake can import later so that your downstream users don't actually have to redefine what your targets and flags were. They can import this package. Um, and as they import the package, they'll know about all your targets. And so they'll know about all of the compiler flags they need to run. Another piece to this that I'm not going to have too much time to talk about is a config CMake in. Um, but this is essentially like a little piece of CMake code that your downstream users run just to double check that they can use your package. Okay, so I've gone through the, the CMake lists, probably the most complicated part of this, this talk, and I've, I've not given it all the detail that it needs because there's a whole lot of uh, great documentation and resources and examples out there. Um, this is kind of the, the view from a thousand feet. Once you've gotten your CMake working and you're happy with your CMake install process, um, check and run your tests with CMake. Um, if you've put in C tests, then you can run C test. 
make sure that you go through um, kind of the manual steps that you do are to, to go through and update your change log. Again, uh, work on the documentation. Create a tag when you're happy with everything and the documentation is good that says um, what, what you did and creating your um, creating your, your tagged version so that users can see these tags. When you publish these things to GitHub, then um, it will look like a list of tags that have been published to GitHub. And you can see each one of these tags as kind of a, a, a tagged release of your software product. This is what it looks like from the downstream. In, in C++, there's not as great of a um, find the, the newest, latest, greatest version feature as there is in, in Python. So in C++, you're really kind of throwing your software over the wall and saying, here's a, a tag, everyone needs to go find it. You can actually help users to find those by um, you know, mailing lists or ways that you contact your users, uh, talk about the new changed features, um, et cetera, and why people would want to switch, what's changed. Uh, you have to remember to go back and change your public facing websites and all the pointers and, and documentation that, that point to your code. If you've put in a spec package that downloads and installs your code, you have to remember to go and talk, uh, change that as well. Uh, you might want to create a checklist for yourself on these things. Net result of the CMake process is that we've taken kind of a basic CMake list that worked for us during development, and we've documented it. We've added uh, config CMake so that so that uh, CMake can install its its list of targets as a package. And um, I've also included some tests here so that CMake could run them as part of its testing process. All right, so I want to ask, stop and ask for questions before I move on. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details of these things, uh, but I'm hoping that that I can kind of explain the the process and and what what developers are are doing as they're going through and making their their source code ready for release. There is David. There is one question here. It appears that XA skilled researchers are moving towards CMake. What is the main reason? Um, there. There are a lot of, of competitors to CMake and and other um, kind of standard. How do I want to say this? There, there's a lot of conventions and standards and and packaging package manager utilities that are out there, um, but I think the DOE tends to be rather conservative and and check things that are are going to have enough support and work on the systems that they care about. Um, and so CMake has has a lot of examples and documentation and software that are working on some of the um, on on the the supercomputers that are sitting at DOE sites and and HPC clusters that people are are using a lot. And because of the just the the mass of developers who are using CMake, it's a lot easier to to build and use it. Um, there are some other tools out there, and and you can go and try them, especially if if you have good examples and documentation that are close to what you're doing. Automake is also um, kind of the, what was the standard before CMake. Um, I would say the main advantage of CMake over Automake is that it has, um, it, it has a different process for creating targets that have uh, attributes, have properties, and your, your target properties turning into compile flags is kind of its killer feature. OK, so I'm going to move on. Um, I say a little bit about Fortran yeah, library on. structure in the in the vein of the C++ library structure. Was that it? Uh, no, go ahead. Great. So um, Fortran library structure, I don't have to say too much here because it actually follows pretty much the, the C++ CMake example. Um, you can package up a Fortran library using CMake. Um, some of the difference, differences to note here are that um, with Fortran, you have a single Fortran source file, which when you run gFortran um, will include, will spit out both the, um, the library shared object and mod files. And these, these mod files are the equivalent of the headers. Um, and they're imported from other packages by the use statement. So um, if you in install your mod files into something that is namespaced neatly like this, um, and then you put your library into lib, um, then this is kind of the convention that people are expecting for, for being able to cleanly depend on your uh, Fortran package. 
this line looks a lot like this corresponding line for C++. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to show the, the CMake code again, but it's, it's the same. If I created a CMake module for this, then um, the CMake module would use the, um, would use the import package command to get your, your HDQ Fortran module. Um, I also want to note here that a lot of uh, Fortran programmers like the Fortran package manager, because they say it's just a little bit better than CMake. So if you're in Fortran land, uh, you might give this one a shot and see if it, it does what you want it to do um, while, you, while you consider using CMake. I'm going to point you at some really good examples that I found. Uh, for example, this Cortran library, which is it's well documented. It talks about um, it talks about how to install the library, how to run the tests, etc. And it even has um, it even has source code that is scanned to generate the documentation. Um, so, so my key takeaway is to start from really good examples um, and structure your package following that good example. Last but not least, in terms of uh, conventions that are really helpful for packaging is um, SPAC. I think of SPAC as, as kind of a, a, a way to document what flags you pass to CMake. Um, in the CMake context, it works that way. SPAC also works with other build processes that are not CMake, um, but I'm going to focus on CMake here and say that if you create a SPAC package, um, basically you're creating a package.py file which has the name of your package as a class. This would replace your, your build.sh file that manually calls CMake with some dash D CMake CXX um, compiler name equals, because SPAC will provide its own compiler wrappers as it runs this build process to compile your package with CMake. Um, so SPAC can read this, call CMake, and install your, your program. What this does is um, it allows you to um, systematically named packages and their options. So rather than giving a bunch of dash D flags that say what options your compiler, your package was compiled with, um, SPAC has done all the parsing for you so that you can actually say SPAC install HDQ and you can give it other options of a spec which uniquely specify how your package is being built and what it's depending on. So to talk a little bit more about um, what a package spec is, here's an example from um, the current way that that our system administrators are building software on uh, Frontier. If we're building the MREX package, we pick out um, this specific version that we've tested and we know is working. Um, we add the plus Rockham, um, the, the plus Rockham, uh, what is this option to the package, which which creates the proper dash D flag that goes to CMake, um, and we can disable the CUDA option and set the AMD GPU target. Um, Similar thing ha things happen for other packages. Uh, the, the syntax of a package spec is here. Um, and a killer feature of this, the package spec, again, is that I can use this one liner to explain uh, the constraints that I want, uh, the version that I want, and even the compiler, and, and, and even um, specific dependencies that I want to choose. So if there are multiple ways to provide MPI, uh, this package could say with this dependency spec that I want MPI built in a certain way. Um, and when all this gets compiled and, and installed, it doesn't actually install into user local. It installs into its, um, its own directory. Um, so for example, Hyper -E might install into Hyper, Hyper -E 2240 dash um, this, this SHA sum, which is telling, uh, which is telling SPAC exactly uh, the variant of the package that was installed. That means I can install multiple different variants of Hyper with different um, options side by side. There, um, there are more things you can add to your packaging process once you've got your basic build and install process down. Um, I'm going to list them here and, and note that starting from something simple um, makes it easier to, to build on and, and do more with your packaging. You can add things like, uh, like these extra features, code coverages, uh, type checking, testing tools. Having a good base makes building up your package easier. Um, so again, start from a good build system. Here are a couple other al alternatives to CMake. Um, for the reason that I mentioned earlier, uh, CMake is, is a pretty good path to go because there are a lot of, um, a lot of examples and documentation out there. Um, there are alternatives. So depending on what you find, you, you may want to go with an alternative. Um, 
once you have a good build system, now you can start exploring that on different systems um, and and talking to your users about how you would um, how you would integrate this with the systems. So uh, there there are some package managers out there. SPAC you can think of as like a package manager for HPC because you can say I want to build my package in a certain way and make sure that all your dependencies have ways to be installed that are coded inside of SPAC. Um, there are some other ways that you can you can do package management as well. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about containers and what they can do for package management, specifically how they make it easy to install dependencies uh, and get up and running when you're when you're trying to test your software or when you're trying to get builds uh, that are reproducible and working. There are many container-like abstractions out there, um, so this slide is a little bit complicated. Um, I just want to focus on the app container. Uh, right here, because usually when people talk about containers, they're referring to, to this one, the programs that are running inside of an emulated file system. So that's distinct from virtual machines um, or guest operating systems. Virtual machines or guest operating systems inside of a hypervisor, containers are, are very lightweight because they don't actually have a, their own concept of an OS. They share the same kernel as your base operating system, but they have an emulated file system so that, so that they're overlaying files that only they see. Um, and that way you can use you can use libraries that look like system libraries but are actually provided by your own programs. And of course, they run one or two user programs. Usually, it's just this the entire container is built to support just one program. I'm not going to talk uh, too much about this slide in the interest of time, um, but it should be in the slides that are published online. Basically, containers let us run um, apt-get, pip, spac, et cetera, to install dependencies that our software needs. Um, it's OK to actually run. Uh, the package managers that happen at the system, at this level inside of your container because they're actually making all of their changes to a, a temporary kind of throwaway file system that sits inside the container. Um, and that way you can apt get your dependencies um, or you know spec install your dependencies, then install your own program and then run your tests um, and then report out and you're able to um, and then you know clear out all of the, the mess and rebuild re redo this process. It lets you do the, the integration level test that I was talking about at the beginning. Basically, the process as you're building your container, uh, or the thought process that you want to go through, is to start from some sort of base image, uh, which is it can be a plain vanilla Ubuntu base image, or um, a lot of people are looking at uh, you know, stripped down smaller Linuxes, and then they just apt install everything that they need on top of that. Uh, you can also take one of those and make a new base image by installing some packages and now release your own base image. So there are a lot of base images out there. Um, I would recommend starting from uh, something as simple as possible for your base image. There are a couple of base images available as part of the E4S package, E4S, um, the E4S website release that you could check out as well. Um, the reason you want to start from a simple base image is, is just so that you have kind of a lowest common denominator that most users will have. Install packages that you need as dependencies, copy the sources for your own program, um, and then run your, your program's build and, and test process. OK, so just to give you a flavor of what those container build recipes look like, um, I've been giving you some singularity image format, um, singularity image format build recipes that I guess Singularity wants you to call def files. Um, so here, Bootstrap is looking for, OK, so this is what the user would see as user documentation. Uh, I guess maybe going through the same process that I had before, where we want to document what the user sees and then document what we do. Um, the user would see that we've built our own base image that is hedeq.sif, and then they could take this and install their app as copying a file, and then um, maybe install other things that they need to run their application and then run the app as part of the run script. In order for the user to, to be able to use your image format this way, then you could, uh, for example, build an image like this that says start from a very uh, basic Docker image that's Python 3.9. Um, the Python 3.9 Docker image is, is like a base Ubuntu image, but also includes Python so that you don't have to you know, spend time pip installing, uh, apt installing Python. Now I copy over my hedeq files and I run my own build process. Um, 
and I can provide some help. <clears throat> so this is the, the build file for my KeyDQ library, which then would provide the SIF image file that your users could use if they wanted to build on top of your image, uh, kind of following this arrow here. All right, and here's the build command that, uh, that you can find on the, the Singularity uh, website. I also want to mention Singularity and, and Aptainer, I guess, are, are the same project or split off projects. They're um, closely related projects. After containerization, not a whole lot has actually changed in the package. Um, what we've done is we've just provided this build recipe to explain to Singularity how it could build uh, a container that uses this package. Um, and then I also am thinking it would be a good idea to include the shell script that, that runs Singularity to, to make the SIF file out of the def file. All right, are there questions on containerization before I move on? David, no, I think we can. There are a couple of questions here, but I think we can wait a little. OK, um, I'm aware of the time. I guess I have uh, 13 minutes left, so I want to make sure that I, I'm able to talk a little bit about these examples, but then also um, have time for questions. Performance portability is, is one of those hot topics of how do we, how do we get one source code um, to run on multiple machines and, and actually have good performance there. Um, and what I'm listing in kind of the, the, the fun cartoon are just some doorways that people have tried um, and that, that are out there and that you can use. There, um, OpenMP, which is kind of the, the techie way to do it. There's, um, there's a C++ way that has parallel fours, and there's a lot of uh, toolkits that, that allow you to use these C++, uh, these modern C++ methods. There are also kind of uh, simple um, include, simple header file uh, macro, not header file macros, but there are simple translation layers. So we can actually kind of put a Band-Aid over the, the Q malocs and still use the Q malocs, but think about them as you know this generic malloc that's going to go to different places based on what I do. Um, and then there's the, the really complicated way that I don't recommend of putting if defs everywhere to test what system you're on and using different pieces of code. Um, try, if, if you can, to use the same piece of code. Um, but then be clever about what kind of performance portability strategy you're using so that it's able to compile to the right thing for the right architecture. So I'm picking out some examples of build processes for packages that are, are trying to achieve the complicated goals of performance portability. Um, the first one I'll talk about is DCA++, which is dynamic cluster approximation that does uh, correlated electron structure. It's a C++ code that does a lot of matrix multiplies, so it depends on the magma code for its, its plus, but it also has its own um, matrix math library for some of its special operators. Um, they want to go from CUDA and also add a hit back end, but make minimal changes. Uh, so the solution, of course, is going to be uh, something that's, that's reusing as much of the CUDA code as they possibly can. To do that, what they've actually done is uh, included this CUDA to hip library, which comes from uh, TY White Cray Quip. Um, and this CUDA to hip header translation library will basically take every time a, a CUDA malloc is called and turn it into a hip malloc um, just by number defining uh, CUDA malloc equals hip malloc. They do have a little bit of extra, um, extra stuff that they do that's slightly different, like error handling between CUDA and hip. Um, and I've included some references here that you can go through and, and peruse if you want to take this strategy. I, because interoperation of Python with, with C is also um, a really common goal for a lot of uh, our, our HPC packages. We want to compile a fast C code that, that's going to work um, at machine speed and then have a Python library that's sitting on top of it. Um, PySCF is a code that provides an extension template. So the problem they're trying to solve is to allow users of, of the PySCF Python code to make their own C efficient C uh, plugins. To plug in a C code into their PySCF you know, upstream library code, what they do is they provide you a template. They say, here's a setup.py file, and here's how we want you to structure your, your plugin so that we can compile your plugin and import it um, and use it in, inside of, and use it as part of the uh, PySCF. The, the actual magic kind of uh, critical part of that template that makes things happen is that they have translated kind of a high level description of your package that the developer, that the developer provides 
Um, so the, the developer gives a name for their, their extension module, a list of source codes, and a, the libraries that it depends on um, into setup.py. And so the developer you know, changes a few things with setup.py, but then setup.py actually translates that into stuff that Python needs in order to uh, compile and use that as an extension. So they, they've provided kind of this little shim layer that lets the user, um, that, that lets the, the, the developer of the extension um, document how their extension is structured in a way that PySCF can then import without forcing the developer to look through the import method. Um, another real world example is uh, ZFP, which is a scientific data compression library, and it focuses on multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, they wrote their compression library in, in C++, but they wanted to allow users in other languages to also use that code. So they actually, um, for Python interoperability, adopted the scikit build process. I'm linking you here to scikit build. It's really well documented, um, and it's a great way to um, to build a Python extension module and import it from C++. Um, that also has a CMake uh, process uh, attached to it. The the kind of the, the central piece that makes this thing work is that their their CMake lists has an add Cython target provided again by Scikit build. This Cython target makes a uh, extension module called ZFP from a piece of source code that's written in Cython. The Cython source code is pretty much C, it's like a domain specific language for writing the extension module that lets you write something that looks very much like Python, but is calling C functions. And so here, the Python function compress array can now call some C functions and use C data structures that are defined inside of the um, Python-like header files. Um, I'm going to point you to this example, and if you're interested, I encourage you to read more about it. Finally, I want to talk about Kibana, which is a package that does molecular dynamics um, depending on some, some really big libraries. Uh, well, I guess some really powerful libraries, not necessarily big, but uh, Cocos is a performance portability abstraction layer, and it's um, it's built using SPAC. And so the, the challenge that they want to overcome is to actually just explain to users how they can compile Kibana using uh, SPAC and uh, based on the Cocos backend and all the different um, hardware methods that Cocos provides. The solution is to, to carefully document the SPAC options that are required from its Cocos dependency. Um, so the key pieces that make this work are the SPAC package for Kibana imports the SPAC package for Cocos. And when it does that, um, it can ask the SPAC package for Cocos about the backends that it is supporting and about the versions that it's supporting. Um, and then it can kind of copy those transitively into its own dependencies. So it can say that the Kibana package is going to depend on um, HIP if the Cocos package was built to depend on HIP. And again, I'm, I'm giving you the, the view from a, a thousand miles here, and you can dig into these examples um, and customize them. Um, also, as a general rule, uh, SPAC is kind of complex, but if you find an existing package inside of it that does um, a lot of the same processes that you need for your package, then you can base your package on it and get really far. Um, as a conclusion, always document what you're doing. Uh, think about users as you're documenting, and um, and don't think that your your make file or your script is a substitute for those for those explanations. There are a lot of good standards to choose from, so you pick, want to pick the one that's easiest to adapt to your use case. Um, and as you package, you can use that as a tool to help you interact with your users, improve your own developer experience, um, but also uh, deploy faster and test your software. So that's all. David, thank you. I have some questions for you. So one of the participants would like to know your opinion or suggestions on single sourcing a package's version from the source code manager like Git. On single sourcing. Maybe I should switch over and look at the... Um, the chat or... The, yeah, the chat itself. It's uh, Diego Menendez's question. Hi, David. Can you hear to me? Yes. So by single sourcing, I mean, instead of writing the version in more than one place, just grabbing the, the source 
the version number from from the source control system. I know that there's a setup tools package and a setup tools SCM that is able to do that. I wonder if you have any experience with that one. Yes, and actually, um, I think PyScaffold sets up your projects where where you have to put your version number of your Python package both in setup.cfg and inside of your init.py. Uh, but there's another example using the, the Python poetry package manager that, that populates your program with an init.py that uses setup tools and looks at whatever uh, setup.cfg has defined as your version. Um, so actually I've worked with both and, and I can point you to examples. Uh, I'm not sure if I could recall what where they're sitting off the top of my head. Um, it's great if you can to reduce the number of places your version number sits in your code. Um, I've also seen in C programs where where the the developers provide a package and install script which looks at the current git um, environment and uses git to figure out what version it's on. Yep, thank you. It it used to be done with with subversion very easily just including a, a, a variable name or a subversion kind of comment in any type of code but with git i haven't found a way to do it until recently where i where i found this uh, setup tools scm and it, it seems that it will do the trick uh, only it's a bit more complicated but I, i'm working through it <laughs> right now thank you so much david another question if you i don't know if you're looking at the chat is this pack a good way for a user to install a package with complex dependencies if the platform they're using is not already running this pack? In other words, is it feasible or a good idea to recommend users to install this pack as the easiest way to install your package? It might be. I would recommend uh, just using the the recipe, git clone spac, and um, source the spac environment and use spac install dependencies um, as a test to see whether or not spac already has the dependencies that you care about and whether it will work on your system out of the box. Um, spac usually works on most systems out of the box, in my experience, uh, with only a little bit of tweaking to spac's um, packages.yaml file. And so that's kind of a, a topic for you know, using SPAC. It's you install SPAC and you, you start running SPAC install and you see if it does what you want it to do. Um, most of the time, it, it pretty much does. And so it's, it's great if you have complex dependencies. Um, Deal2 can install uh, with SPAC and it makes my life a whole lot easier. Um, but on the other hand, you do have to spend a little bit of time tweaking the packages.yaml to explain to SPAC what libraries you already have on your system and you do not want SPAC to recompile because it will recompile everything um, that it doesn't already know exists. And uh, David, related to SPAC, there's a question here. Uh, is SPAC comparable to Conda? SPAC is much better than Conda. Um, and every time that I I try and use Conda on systems that I've worked with. It it always ends up it always ends up backfiring on me. Um, and the reason is that thing that I just talked about, packages.yaml. With SPAC, you can tell SPAC what packages exist on your system and that you don't want SPAC to rebuild. With Conda, you're pretty much forced into using the set of dependencies that that Conda gives you. Um, and, and that can be bad because a lot of times those dependencies um, might not be the optimal ones for your system, um, but a lot of times you have a better idea of what your dependencies should be than Conda does. Um, also, Conda is installing binary blobs and SPAC is recompiling so it can use the optimized path for your system. And the final question here, David, changing a little. Does container uh, run slightly slower because of some overhead? Or does it are you container right? Um, is light. Yeah, so containers are super lightweight, um, which actually makes them run pretty much at the same speed as the native system. Uh, there's a star on that comment in terms of the the fact that containers can can 
use their own libraries. So when you build a container and you install a set of libraries um, into that container and you use them, those libraries might not be the you might not have picked the right ones that are optimized for your system. However, if you pick the same libraries and you install them into your container that you have on your base system, um, all the numbers that I've seen indicate that people are getting the same speed from containers as from their uh, the same speed from containers as they're getting from from bare metal. You can also get faster load times on containers for Python programs, just because Python programs look at a lot of files. And if your container packages all those files, um, you now have a, a much faster load time because it's looking in the same place. I think we, we have, uh, are you, we have gone through all the questions here, David. Um, thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you for, uh, all the participants for joining us today. And I have put in the chat, uh, our next webinar in the series is gonna be on the October 12th, investing in code reviews for better research software. And there is a link there for people to uh, sign up. Thank you again. David. Thanks everybody. Thank you all.